Antony of Egypt. I don't know if you know this guy named Antony of Egypt, but he lived to be over 105 years old. That's old. He died in 356 AD. And he lived in the time where Constantinople, a decades before Antony's death, made Christianity public. And he made it uh, public in, I don't remember, but it was in the 330s, something like that. And there was a movement within Christianity that didn't want, did not want it to be public. And the reason why their argument was, is once you make Christianity become the public official religion of Rome, once it becomes your national religion, then you're going to lose... You're going to lose a depth of Christianity. It's just going to become just kind of part of a regular part of life, and you're going to have lots of content Christians, and you're going to lose really the heart of it out of like martyrdom and persecution. That brought something to Christianity the first couple hundred years. And so Antony of Egypt at one point uh, heard a sermon early on, and I think he was 19 years old, he heard a sermon uh, on Luke, the Gospel of Luke, where he asked the rich young ruler to sell all his wealth and give it over to the poor. Well, Antony, he was a fairly wealthy guy. You see, his dad died at an early age. And when his dad died, he inherited his birthplace. And part of his birthplace, he got 200 acres, 200 acres of riverfront property on the Nile River. So imagine 200 riverfront acres on the Guadalupe or Kamau River, right? Beautiful. He sold it all, gave it to the poor, and decided to live a life of solitary. And the word solitary comes from the word monastic, mono, kind of by yourself, where we get the word monk. So Antony of Egypt kind of became the first monk. And he started off outside the city, but that wasn't enough. He noticed that he was still tempted to go back into the city and and kind of hang out with the locals because it's tough being alone. And so he decided to live in an empty old fort by himself, in solitary confinement, except for when certain people would bring food to him and water him. He lived there by himself in a closed room for 20 years. The story goes that finally the villagers came out and knocked the door out from, opened him up, and after 20 years, he walks through the door. And they said there was this enthusiastic glow about him. See, I'm thinking after 20 years, he's going to have, like, pale skin. He's going to be like, I need some Pizza Hut or something. And he's going to be depressed. But in fact, 20 years of solitary confinement, he was this new person because he spent those 20 years devoted to conversation with God. Now, I'm not going to promote that because that means of all four or 500 you leave and go off to the desert, we got some big problems, one of which I lose my job. But more importantly, what we see in this story is Antony of Egypt found the depth of a deep, intimate relationship with God, and the only medium to do so was with prayer. And so, I need to tell you that prayer is a great way in determining our understanding of God and our relationship with God. It's probably the best indicator of your faith. So that said, I, I have to be honest with you. I have had times in my life where you could describe my prayer life as this. Occasional. Impersonal. Inconsistent. Distant. Needy reactive, and I have to wonder during those seasons, are those also the ways to describe my relationship with God? We are finished with Matthew chapter 5, and Jesus talks about some specific ways of of living righteously. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus knows uh, that practices of worship. How we worship have this connection between how we live righteously. And so 
It's brilliant. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's brilliant how he, how he understands how we live righteously. These are ways to live. These are ways to promote good news in other people's life, to bless and encourage people. The next step is how we practice worship. And the ways you practice worship, especially in the areas in the ancient world where prayer, giving, and fasting, those were the key areas. And so Jesus is essentially saying here that some of you think you are worshiping correctly. You are praying and, and fasting and giving. But your intent, right, your, your heart, your, your motivations, they're, they're all messed up. That, that if you are devoted to God, then there shouldn't be any distinction between your worship and your character and your faith and your morals. They're these things. And so he essentially says that some of you are hypocrites. Eyes on me. Everybody look at me. That's essentially what hypocrites are. Hypocrites are you are a bunch of stage actors. That's what hypocrites means in scripture. It means stage actors. That would have been the primary way they would have understood this word would have been hypocrites. And, and I understand a little bit about acting. If you don't know, I have quite the resume when it comes to acting. When I was nine years old, I had one line in the musical Annie. And I was one of those little bully kids when Annie ran away from the house and she got found in the streets. And my line was, as we ran into Annie, we said, so what are we going to do with her? And then my friend next to me said, what we always do, beat her up, right? So, of course, that's what bullies do in alleys in the musical Annie is they take money from kids who have no money. That's a different side. Then my next main acting moment, which is really, really going to get me into Broadway, was more recently was the Joseph Code of Technical Many Colors. Is that how I said it, Jana? See, I don't even know the name of the show. Oh, man. And I will be completely honest with you. This is not flattering at all. This is not self-promotion. That was difficult for me. That was humili humiliating in some aspects. And I'll tell you why. Because stage acting, which the word comes persona, is that you have to remove your own mask of who you are and put on the mask of somebody else. And my person was Naphtali. One of the brothers. And I have no idea how to be Naphtali. And so this whole process was me trying to figure this out about who is this Naphtali guy. And I, I, I couldn't do it at times. I struggled. And I didn't get it. But that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, look, you're just trying to get on stage. You're trying to show off. You're, you're trying to say, look at me. Self-praise, look at what I'm doing, I want to get noticed. This isn't the Antony of Egypt who goes off and shuts himself in the fort. This is somebody else who, who plants himself in the middle of the stage and says, Look, I can pray like the best of them, and I can fast like the best of them, and I can give like the best of them. I want to get noticed. And Jesus says to them, You will get your reward. You will be noticed. But when you pray genuinely, you will also get your reward. I, I want to I make that clear because I, I think what Jesus is saying here is, no, listen to me, you are going to get a reward. And, and, I, and I think that's important. I think we need to know that being a Christian and practicing with, in terms of worship and, and understanding what that is, that, that we will receive a reward. It's not like we're just doing this for nothing. And so there is a great reward for us in our spiritual practices like prayer. And so Jesus wants to, us to understand what that reward is. And so I want to close us off thinking about what it means, what that reward is when we have real prayer. You see, when Jesus asks us to go into our rooms and shut the doors for our real prayers, he's using a figure of speech. He's not saying don't pray publicly or don't have long prayer. What he's saying is this. He says, you know, Jesus is saying that when you went to trek a couple of weeks ago, when you pray, when you go into the deepest part of the forest, 
where the only thing you might hear is maybe some bugs and maybe a squirrel or two, where no one can see you. And in that moment where you are not heard, where you are no longer seen, that that is the place where you can speak to God in ways you've never done before. Where you can share your soul and your secrets and your heart with God. And so you can do that in a synagogue. That's great. And you can do that on a street corner. Okay. But if you can take that true part of who you are and go off somewhere and shut the door and just have that moment between you and God that vulnerable experience, that is where you'll find the depth of your relationship with God. When your kids are fast asleep, it's been a long day at work, and in that hidden place where it's only you and God, pray. When you are missing a loved one, maybe, maybe they've died, and it's gut-wrenching because no matter what, there are no acts of words, there are no kindness and compassion that somebody else can give you that will alleviate the pain, no matter what. It doesn't matter, it hurts. You are in that dark, quiet place. God asks you to pray. When you're at the hospital bed, and you are surrounded by loved ones, friends, church members, cards, flowers, poor television TV shows, around-the-clock nurses and doctors, beeping sounds that make no sense to you all hours of the night. And yet, with all the noise and chaos and visits, you absolutely still feel lonely. God says, pray. You see, in true prayer we find that God is no stranger to us. We are not outsiders to God, but we are God's own children. Prayer is God meets us in compassionate ways, tender, nurturing, and loving. You see, we are known so well by God. God is that twin, right, that can finish your sentence. God is that friend that we can trust. God is that parent that already knows our heart and intentions even before we speak. And here's the irony. This is what happens when your prayer life is described in that way and you do so in a public way. This is what happens. This is what happens at the church that we pray at. This is what happens in the home where we pray in front of our kids, or at the hospital room, or at the table in the restaurant. I, I, I love one of, Jake does this really well. I've known others who've done this, but he asks simply servers, hey, can I pray for you? What can I pray for you for? And sometimes those servers will even pray with Jake. I know others do that, it's great. And this is what happens at the band or football field when you figure out this prayer life. And this is what happens at the deep forest on trek, or that walk in the morning, or the bike ride, or even in the closet. This is what happens. All of these places, and much more, and the list goes on, become houses of prayer. Closets become houses of prayer? That's strange. Hospital beds? Classrooms? Office space? Around your dinner table? Here in the church? All of these places become houses of prayer. These otherwise maybe mundane and even uncomfortable spaces become holy ground because in prayer we have access to the presence of God. And that's what happens when God is our audience, when God has our attention. That is the holy experience 
I mean, think about it. The first couple books of the Bible, Genesis and most of Exodus, we are taught that God is not restricted in a particular location, but is made known holy wherever God's people go, wherever God's people are present. Build an altar here, build an altar here. In fact, one of the most holy places that God has found is in a very dying, brittle, burning bush. And yet... When we make God known, God can make anything holy. And we can make anything a house of prayer. And yet we are so disturbed by society and news and media. And we're disturbed by our future and what's happening. And I wonder if, our, if the reason why we're in fear and anxiety and, and why we are disturbed is because maybe we haven't allowed ourselves to make these various parts of our life, to make these the center place of our prayer. Because we can't just stand out on the street corners and scream, we believe and we think about God and God this, God is awesome. And then yet inside we are scared and fearful of our future. We struggle with, with the news that we've received or the pain that we endure. And God says, take the most mundane and hidden places of your life like a closet and make those places the centerpiece of your holy experience with God. Make cancer the centerpiece and the holy experience with God. Make that loss of job that you received the center place and the holy experience of God. And that is where you will find God's heart and God's compassion and God's sincerity. You see, immediately following how God is speaking about what prayer ought to be, God goes deeply into what that looks like. You see, in true prayer... We see that God is a God that responds and acts in intimate ways. No longer are we intimate, no longer are we distant, and no longer are we needy. God is urging us to pray. And when we respond with receptivity to God, we become an opening and channel of God's saving power in the world. Like Jesus in praying, this is what happens. We run the risk of being used by God as a channel to accomplish God's will for creation. I love that quote. Because that's what good prayer is. It is an opportunity for us to make God's will known. To make more holiness available to our own lives and to the lives of others. God's will for creation. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus uh, concludes this section of prayer on how we should pray. And so this week in your prayer life, I encourage you to read Matthew 6. This week, when you pray, I encourage you in your prayer to read Matthew 6. Just make that your prayer this week. And more specifically, I, I want to ask you to take a look at Jesus' first week request from God. What is his first request? God, may your will be done. God's will. Oh, that's hard. Because if you're on that street corner trying to flatter yourself, you're thinking about your own will. But God's will. God's will for creation. And so when, when we ask God's will to be done in our lives, we are essentially saying to this to God. I am yours. My religion, my practices, my spirituality, my relationship with you is no longer for personal gain, but I am yours. It is no longer an act. This is vulnerable. This is scary. It's risky, but I invite you, God, I invite you, God, to use me in incredible ways. 
I'm taking off the actor's mask. This is genuine. Come to me, God. May your will be done.